Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. It's Wednesday, so it's time for another midweek mini mail call. And this time I'm going to try something a little bit different. I have a big backlog of packages that I've opened. I've already recorded the initial opening part, but I haven't yet filmed the on the bench segment. But I've got a few more packages here that I haven't opened yet, and I want to try to avoid the huge pile of packages that I hadn't opened like last time. So I want to start opening these up as I go. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to grab one. I'm going to open it and do the bench segment at the same time. So I have no idea if I'm going to get through one package or multiple packages here. So we'll just see how it goes. But I still got to get back to all that stuff I've already opened. So don't worry, this is only temporary because I only have a few packages I haven't yet opened as opposed to the pretty substantial backlog of stuff that I have opened. but not yet shown. Does that make sense? Anyhow, okay, so without further ado, let's get right to it. Okay, the first one to start off with in this weird format is a little package USPS and it comes from, strangely, it says Dr. Death. Should I be worried? There's no other information on the return address. So let's just cut this open, see what it is. Okay, what do we have in here? That's it for the box. Something. Something small. Well, what is this? Okay, this looks like definitely something for the Commodore 64. Okay, so there's a little rotary switch. Hopefully the focus is cooperating. And then I can see down there, it says dead test and other diagnostics. There's a couple jumpers and there looks to be a list of things to pick from, dead test. Diagnostic, there's a number 64 doctor. Okay, so I mean, without reading through the rest of those, obviously this is a 64 diagnostic cartridge with a very handy 3D printed case for easy insertion and removal from the 64. Let me grab a 64 so we can just give this thing a quick test. This video is gonna be less editing than normal <laughs> just because I'm trying to speed up the process of making them a little bit. So we'll grab the ZIF-64 here. ZIF-64 is all hooked up and obviously you see that it is working. We have a nice video capture. Let's pop this cartridge in. Oh no, <laughs> there is definitely a problem. That's weird, this doesn't really fit very well. I wonder why. Okay, so I got it in, but I had to lift the motherboard out of the case. All right, there it is, running the regular diagnostic test. So that's kind of cool, but yeah, it doesn't fit super well in this case. Now this case, I think it's missing. I can lift it in this corner because the standoff I think is completely broken there. So probably the entire cartridge slot probably sits a little bit lower than it should in a regular 64. But I'm guessing that maybe the spacing's a little off. And once I lift the case up, it, it goes in okay. Yeah, it's okay, it's okay actually. And it's quite easy to remove, so I like that. Let's swap the little switch here. So right now it is set to one, which says diagnostic test. Uh, here's SID test number five. Let's switch this over to five. Okay, now let's see what the SID test does. Unfortunately, the SID audio is not hooked up, so we're not gonna hear anything. Okay, so I actually did hook up a speaker because now that I booted this up, it says Cybernoid 2 by Joran Tell. He's a great composer for 64 music. So let's hit F1, turn up the sound.
Okay, that's pretty cool. So I think that music, uh, you know, once I get to know it, it'll be a really good test of the SID capability of a machine. Now switching between dead test and the regular diagnostic is not super convenient because of these jumpers here. I could uh, get some of these longer jumpers. I think I have some floating around. They're like easy to grab with your fingers and they would stick out further. But the reason why Dr. Death sent this is because I mentioned in one of my recent videos that I didn't have, that I was you know, constantly switching back and forth between dead test and regular diagnostic because I have that little test cartridge I use all the time. Well, with this, I could just leave this on standard diagnostics and then I can just leave my other one on dead test and I can just swap back and forth without having to do too much um, extra work there. So yeah, that's pretty cool. Thank you very much, Dr. Death. And I get, I get the name now. Dr. Death, because like, I'm a doctor of dead Commodore 64s to try to bring them back to life, right? <laughs> that's that's kind of cool. And uh, oh, I can see, uh, let's see if I can get this to focus. Look at that, some scratch marks on there from sticking it into the case. The back it's fine. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit of scratching going on there. So obviously this uh, is at the very limit of the 64. Actually, it seems like it's getting a little bit easier to plug in now that I've plugged it in a couple times. Awesome. Thank you very much, Dr. Death. I really appreciate that. Okay, here's the next package. It says Horton on the side, not too heavy. This comes from David in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Hi to all my viewers in South Dakota. What did I do with my knife? Here it is. We have a note in here. Let's just take a gander at the note. Hello, Adrian, just another viewer that enjoys your content. You post every week. Still need to find the time to watch your older videos. Anyway, here's my small contribution to the basement. If you don't have a use for it, feel free to pass it on, as you said you have done in the past. Some background is needed. You may remember back in the late 90s and early 2000s, it was not uncommon to customize PC cases or even build them entirely from scratch. One of the most famous case builders from this era was John Mashey Grunstrom, some of his case builds include the Y2K bug, Project Anemone, and quote unquote three. Mashi built Project Anemone for a competition in 2002 and which I understand was the winning entry. It was a PC built into an old radio enclosure and its most prominent feature was an LED display that moved in sync with the sound, which resembles a sea monster. <laughs> Very cool. Evidently, the LED display was popular enough that Mashi eventually commissioned a small production run of a scaled down version of this display and sold it as the Mashi Design Visual Audio Kit. It takes five volts through standard Molox connector and the audio is connected through a line in cable. It is proportioned to fit into the two empty CD bays or five and a quarter inch bays in a typical tower case. I had planned to make it into a standalone unit since I don't hear so well, but never got around to it. I only recently found this again while doing a bit of cleaning and decided it's time to pass it on. Perhaps it could be used to provide a bit of visual accompaniment to some of the music you play, like say the 8-bit dance party. Anyway, keep up the great content, David. That sounds cool. Wow, oh, it's still in the original box. All right, that's it. So look at this, the mashy design visual, uh, I'm mean, sorry, Mashi designed visual audio. How freaking cool. Let's take a look at this. This is like a fascinating little piece of history. So this thing is uh, pretty neat actually. It's a bent piece of smoked acrylic, Mashi designed visual audio, a couple buttons there. There's an IC, I can see a lot of LEDs, a few other ICs down there. Some other components. There is the standard Molex connector on the back. PCB design. I wonder what this is. This has got to be the audio connection. Oh, he's included the cable here. So let's just uh, check this out quickly. Yep, there it is. So this has uh, audio pass through, 3.5 millimeters. Pretty freaking cool. Let's get a power supply, test this out. In fact, I'm going to go grab the 64 and we're going to play some SID tunes through this thing, see how it looks. Okay, it's powered up, which it sort of displays, well, it seemingly was going through some different patterns. And then I plugged it into the 64 and it hasn't been doing anything. There's no audio on the 64 right now. I have it just booted up with the diagnostic cartridge from Dr. Death. Uh, I'm gonna hit F1 to start the SID tune. This is Cybernoid 2. Here we go.
So I'm wondering why it's only showing the little LEDs on one side, because it definitely has LEDs around the whole thing. So maybe it's right and left, and the jack on here is only outputting in mono. But there is a jumper here for mono. Oh, wait, what's it doing now? Uh, hmm, pattern. No, oh, there we go. I think it was just a bad connection. Okay. So yeah, that's pretty cool. Check it out. Look, different patterns. So this is sort of like a spectrum analyzer, that the ones we were just looking at. And that's, yeah, this is pretty cool. I mean, this was in the old days. You know, nowadays, this stuff is not hard to do with microcontrollers and all the stuff we have available to us. You, you wouldn't really struggle with things like this. But this was, what, like 20 years ago. Things were not so easy. Stuff like this would have been really cool to look at. Let's just look through these different settings here. Well, wow, that's hot on my 64. And I was like, what is my arm touching that's, that's so hot? So that's pattern. Let's see, there's a sensitivity button. I guess to control how sensitive it is. So that's a little more active. And we have a brightness control. So probably does some like PWM type dimming. Three levels of that. And then a pattern. Yeah. And obviously if you had actual stereo sound, you would be getting uh, differences on the right and left. And these patterns are just... Really, really cool. Oh, this is like a, it looks like uh, starting from the center. Oh, this is, this is very cool. Let's, let's turn the audio back up so you can hear the music. Well, that is just such a cool part of history right there. Really, really cool. I wonder how many of these were made. The only thing I'm afraid of is that this type of material, this type of uh, plexiglass is very easy to get scratched. So I just have to be very careful with it, not to rub it. There you can kind of see the LEDs in action in there. I don't need a Molex power input anymore. It only uses five volts, just a little five volt. Oh, probably I'll just add a little USB jack onto here. And that way I could just power this up from a power bank or whatever much more easily. Obviously when this king came out, USB wasn't the ubiquitous thing it is now for powering stuff. So <laughs> that's, and it's the Molex of course, and this would go inside the computer. It does have a couple holes right here for being screwed into the case. So thank you very much, David, for sending this in. This is a little piece of history right here. I just absolutely freaking love it. All right, here's a package. It comes from Michael in Hampstead, Maryland. Hi to all my Maryland viewers. What do we have in here? You kind of get a direct view into the box with this setup I'm doing here. Uh, REU plus 2C. REU, like RAM expansion unit. This is a PCB in here, I can feel that. So set that to the side. We have another PCB it looks like. We have a piece of candy here. What is this? Hmm. I don't immediately recognize this. Is this, uh, it looks like Spanish on here. Okay. So let's see, um, let's check out what looks like the letter here. So the letter from Mike talks about all the stuff that's in here. So let's just put this aside for a sec and we'll just kind of scan through. Whoops, another piece of candy fell on the floor here. We'll scan through. What we have here, ooh, there's goodies galore here. 
goodies galore. Wow. All right, well, let's start here. The magic disc, or no, magic desk. Wow, look at this. The magic desk, one megabyte with a B, as a button, and magic desk, one megabyte with an A? What? <laughs> what? Okay, I'm gonna have to look at, the, his letter will describe what this is. So let's look at that in a second. I can't read what this says, so we'll just cut through the scotch tape. What is this? Another cool 64 thing. Um, I don't know, it plugs into the user port. It's got LEDs, it's got a button. Not sure, don't know what that is. Uh, okay, we have this here. Well, this really looks like something to do with the diagnostic test harness from Sven Peterson. It says Diag 586-220 cassette. And there's the header there, but I just, it's passed through. Open source hardware. Oh, it is Sven Peterson there on the op on the, the GitHub URL. So interesting. It's different than the one I have. Let's see what this is. All right. This here obviously is some kind of a kernel ROM thing. He's got a, a socket, a sacrificial socket on there just to keep the pens, pins from bending. So yeah, we have a 27F512 on here. I can see there's an LED sort of slid in here. This is obviously for the case. Uh, you would connect this up most likely to these headers here, and that would give you a different color depending on which kernel you're running. And I can see a microcontroller there. It's probably an AT Tiny. And I think with that AT Tiny there, that allows you to select different ROMs. This is probably a Fen Peterson design as well. Switchless kernel switcher, 1.21. For C64 longboard, BWAC 2019. Okay, so this is the BWAC design. I think I had some of these PCBs made up and I've actually never tried to build one up before. All right, here is another cartridge. It's a double-sided one. It's diagnostic one way and dead test the other. And so I didn't realize it, but these are 3D printed. Really, really nice 3D printing, I gotta say. But um, Mike reached out to me and we talked about this briefly, this double-sided cartridge. So yeah, I pop it in one way, dead test, flip it around, diagnostic. And that is the thing that I'm always going back and forth on. I, I need those two things and I'm always fiddling with those switches on that little cartridge I use in my repair-a-thons. So this is just awesome. All right, and this here, let's see. So C128, oh, I think I can tell me that this is this thing here for the 128D to test the keyboard. So it uses a external keyboard, right? Versus all the other Commodores. And it uses a 25 pin connector. And really I'm like, wow, there's no way for me to test this. And I have a 128D. I think this is for Sven's test harness. And I can tell already there's a bag of parts right here that are, yeah, designed for making the cables and stuff that connect into these, these pin headers here, like this as well. And uh, that would allow you to hook it up and test. In fact, I, I was like, is this part of it here? I mean, I don't know. So usually there's something that plugs into the user port. Oh, here it says user port right here. So this clearly is part of the test harness. So this is also user port, but I, I don't know what that does. All right, here it is. So this is clearly diagnostic related. Come on camera, focus. Anyhow, yeah, so that's more ICs than I recall. So two controller, well, controller one, controller two, and then it has cassette and the keyboard connector. So it's similar to what I was expecting. Yep, Sven Peterson. Hmm. And there's also a setting right here for SX64 or C64. This is obviously a newer revision than the one that I have currently. Okay, this one here says C64 keyboard. So this is obviously the little uh, keyboard header. Well, this one is certainly more fancy than the one I have because the one I have, if I can get the camera to focus, come on, what? This thing is just horrible. There we go. So, um, so the one I have doesn't have a connector, it's just a loop back and you just plug it in and that's it, there's no cable. So that's what's different here. 
is that there is a keyboard connection here, and that's different. I don't even know what that does exactly, but perhaps that's better testing than um, the one I have now. I don't know. Okay, this one here, it's a PCB in here, and it says PCB or PSU Global. So I'd assume this is, yeah, probably like Sven's C64 PCB design. Who made this? Is it Sven as well? Yeah, Sven Peterson as well. So this is a replacement C64 power supply board. It uses a new transformer, and then this, if I recall, is like a five volt regulator or something. I don't know, I, I can't remember exactly how this works. I, of course, I built my own. I just used like a nine volt power supply out of a Linksys router, and I used a regular five volt switching power supply out of a, I don't know, it's four amps, and I stuck it in a 3D printed case. But with something like this, this might fit. I don't know what this fits in. This does not fit. This would not fit in the standard 64 brick, I don't think. But maybe it would. I don't know. C64 PSU Global. Oh yeah, mains input, 115 slash 230 switch right there. Right here, it's got the five volts ground and nine volts AC output. So that's the cable that goes to your computer. There's a panel meter. So I guess you can keep tabs on the voltage if you so desire. There's a fuse here, there's a fuse there. I assume somewhere on here, there's like a bridge rectifier or something, voltage main switch. So yeah, okay, that's kind of cool. And then here it is, the REU plus 2C. So now that I know this is all Commodore stuff, because it's gotta well be for the RAM expansion unit replacement or something. So this is a cartridge slot connector for the 64. I guess we got FPGA things going on here. I don't quite know. I am very lucky to have an actual 512K REU. It's one from a, a six, uh, what is it actually? It's a 1750. So is that the one from the 128? But it works in the 64 and it will expand it to 512K with software that supports it. This has an SD card slot here, these headers, a bunch of surface mount ICs. There's a little bit of passives on the back. So um, yeah, interesting. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's move on to the letter here. Oh, and there's the candy there. So in the letter, sure enough, yeah, double-ended diagnostic and dead test cartridge, Sven Peterson's diagnostic test harness boards, the double-ended magic desk cartridge, it's this one here, switchless kernel mod by BWAC, Sven Peterson's C64 Wi-Fi modem, Oh, that's this. That's this. It's got these LEDs on it. Okay, that's pretty cool. The REU Plus 2C bare circuit board and Sven Peterson's PSU board, the global one, and two very delicious chocolates right there. So he says the diagnostic test harness is an updated version than the one I have, and it tests the C128 keyboard. And he hasn't tested it because he doesn't have a C128. Uh, here it is. So. When you look into the C128, the, I think the D, ver the reason why this has two connectors on it is I think the D version would require like this, like this is the connector that goes on the outside of the computer. And then next up, the Magic Desk here, the blended Magic Desk cart has one meg EEPROM on each end. You can create your own software collection with a menu and burn it into the EEPROM. I've assembled and tested the cartridge with other EEPROMs. The EEPROMs I've supplied in the cartridge are blank because they are large EEPROMs and seem to take a really long time to erase. Okay, thank you. I'm not sure if that's normal or if it's because they're used to refurbish chips from China. I've inspected a few chips from the batch I ordered and they have definitely been relabeled. That's so bad but I'm quite confident they are genuine. More information on this project is available here. Okay, there's the link. Next, he's talking about this, which is the kernel switcher from BWAC. He was able to get it working with four ROMs. Uh, he says it has current limiting resistors built in for the LEDs, so you don't need to worry about those. And it looks like he's already loaded some stuff on there. So it's funny because um, I did do a video a while back where I built a kernel switcher with an Arduino myself. And I mean, there were already projects like this, but I just thought it'd be fun to try. And now there's several of these out there. Um, some might be based on my code. I have no idea, but I knew there were already other projects. Well, after I made mine, I, when I looked it up, there were other projects that did the same thing. Um, now the thing is, funny thing is, I don't generally use these that much anymore for a couple reasons. One is I have the Easy Flash 3 cartridge, which can load, you know, or replace the kernel ROM without having to take the chip out of the board. But even more so is I now have ROMs that I can just program 
like this one right here that I can just program Jiffy DOS. Oh, it's not even in focus. I have ROMs just like this one that I can just program and directly stick into a C64 without any additional wiring or whatever, and it just works. Now, it only holds one ROM image, so I can't turn off Jiffy DOS, but look, to be honest, I don't think I ever find that I need to turn off Jiffy DOS. I know there is incompatibility sometimes, but I don't seem to run into those problems much. Um, and and if I did, I just could stick in the uh, Easy Flash 3 and just put it back to stock with that. So it's one of the reasons why uh, these are really, really useful to people who, you know, want to just buy something and stick in your computer and have selectability like that. But I got to say, like, just burning these are just, it's just easier. There's nothing to program or worry about. Although this is so simple and easy that it's pretty cool. I think there's a little bit of IO that goes to this. I don't know if this uses the restore key to do the switching or if it um, does it by holding down one of the keys on the keyboard. But anyways, um, the URL will tell. But uh, yeah, this is my trick. The thing is, of course, is programming these chips like this one right here. It's only really possible because I have a Data IO 2900 programmer. You can't program these, well, not easily on something like a Mini Pro. So that's one of, of course, the, the gives, but yeah. So anyways. All right, the Wi-Fi modems, ESP8266, and of course, Sven Peterson has the level shifters to, uh, to protect the 64. It is using Bo Zimmerman's Z modem firmware, which is great, it's very, it's very useful. And it can work with regular software like Quantum Link. Uh, I'm familiar with the firmware because I actually have some modems that I program myself, just little standalone ones. In fact, um, here is one right here. So this is one I 3D printed, it's USB powered. Um, it has a normal serial level, line level connector here. Um, inside here is EDA, ESP8266, and then there's a, like a shifter with a MAX 323 in there, just so I can plug this into even regular computers, like a IBM PC or whatever, and get online with that. And if I want to use my Commodore, what I do is I use this. So I have this modem here, well, which has been gutted and no longer has a modem. What it has is this, which converts from the TTL serial lines here on the user port to regular RS-232 on a 9-pin. And in combination with my little 3D printed modem here, I just use a 9-pin connector between them. This allows me to, well, connect the, the, the 64 up to anything that's regular RS-232 or I can plug it into my, my little modems. I did this quite a while ago, um, but you know, so it's kind of cool to have an all-in-one uh, solution like this though. I gotta say, I like your 3D printing filaments. It's very close in color to the original Commodore uh, beige. That's pretty cool. Mike has gone ahead and programmed this in and put in some speed dials for me. It's a couple of different uh, BBSs here, the Neo Habit, Cottonwood BBS, that's awesome couple links here, which I'll of course put in the description below. And then here it is, the REU Plus 2C board designed by Jeff Burrell and this is, uh, is for building of FPGA REU clone with 32 megs of RAM. How wild. I built one myself so I can play Sam's Journey on an NTSC C64. It performs flawlessly in my limited testing. Like I mentioned, I'm very lucky to have an REU, an actual Commodore one. I can't imagine that Sam's journey requires um, to have like more than 512K of RAM on that REU. Like this one here gives you 32 megabytes. I'm not sure what exactly can use that, but that's pretty cool. Now, the reason why this has to be so complicated with FPGA is because the REU uses a special design chip from Commodore, custom designed, that handles the DMA transfers between this and the system. So that chip is not really replaceable. It's made by Commodore. They only made a limited amount that were inside of the actual Commodore REUs. And then CMD, the, the guys who made um, the you know, Jiffy DOS and stuff like that, they had an REU cartridge as well. But from my understanding, it actually uses the Commodore chip. Like they were able to procure old, new old stock of those ICs, and all of their REUs also use that Commodore chip. So unless you have uh, th that chip lying around, you have to replace it with an FPGA board like this, if you're gonna tr get true REU compatibility. And then he says there's Sven Peterson's the power supply board, which is right here. Selectable mains input voltage. Maybe I'll find a use for one. 
And on the last page here, he says, two chocolates from my wife's stash. That is all she was willing to give up. Enjoy them. Thank you for making the great videos. I enjoy your repair videos. I hope you find these items useful. And thanks to all the people designing these devices and keeping the retro hobby alive and interesting. Absolutely. Thank you, Mike. Um, let's dig into one of these chocolates here. What? Yeah, where is this from? Mm -mm -mm. Let's see here. Let's see if I can see any stuff on the back. Oh, it looks decadent, like a little puff ball. Like, and yeah, so this is the company name up here. It's also down here, Garato, and it's Brazilian. So that's why I am not familiar with it. Maybe his wife is Brazilian. Let's give this a, a taste test. Oh, that's delicious. It's sort of a, has a crunchy inside, a soft layer, and then the milk chocolate. And it's a really mild taste. It's not overly sweet. That's really, really good. That is so delicious. Yum, 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 yum. Absolutely fantastic. I will be saving this one for later. Oh, it's handy here that you included some paper towels. I can wipe the chocolate off my fingers. <laughs> Okay, so, so many goodies here. I can't test everything here. I am going to test this double-ended diagnostic cartridge. I have to be careful not to say the double-ended thing I was, yeah, anyways, popped into my head. And the double-ended, um, <laughs> the double-ended magic desk cartridge. Uh, he said these are blank, so I'm not sure. I'll plug this in, it might not actually do anything, but uh, we will give these a quick test. All right, so the machine is definitely working. Uh, let's take, I don't know, let's just do Magic Desk A. Stick this in. No, that didn't do anything. That just gave me the regular desktop. Let's open this thing up, take a quick look inside. I like this printing though, I have to say. Mike did a good job here. These are very thick and, um, oops, sturdy feeling. Okay, there we go. MCC801 EEPROMs. Those are the one megabyte ones. They are definitely chunky and yes, absolutely have been rebadged. And really this is just the regular old Magic Desk uh, cart split in the middle and inverted. And on the back here, yeah, PCB Way, not a sponsor or anything like that, based on original design by Marco Solzik or something. I'm, I know I'm mispronouncing his name, I apologize. I recently was given a bunch of these from a viewer, these EEPROMs here. These are 27C020s, so definitely not the same. These are C801s, same number of pins and everything, but I guess these are not as high capacity. Hmm, interesting. I mean, these are genuine ones. They were pulled out of Cisco Systems stuff at some point in their life. All right, so there's nothing really more to test here because I will have to go ahead and create some ROM images to put onto there. So I'm just gonna lightly reassemble this. Oh, don't wanna mix it up. I guess there is no mix up A or B. Let me just put this back together. I'll have to, um, I'll have to make some follow-up videos where I test out that other stuff like the test harness or it might be repair -a -thon, to be honest, but uh, where I try this out, Wi-Fi modem, stuff like that. I actually have so much Commodore stuff, things like this to actually try out um, and unfortunately, <laughs> with all the projects in the basement right now, it's not always easy for me to uh, spend the time and effort to kind of figure out how these work properly to, to do the testing. Okay, so we have diagnostic one way and dead test the other. So this is going to be the dead test way. It goes in really nicely. Let's turn on the machine. We're just waiting, looking at a black screen, and there it is. Yes, of course, this machine actually works. That is, um, it's expected. It would be very sad if my Ziff 64 were broken. Okay, I flipped it around, and of course, diagnostics come right up. This is so handy. I freaking love it. Let's see. Uh, well, there's no point to open it because, you know, it's obviously just going to be a couple of EEPROMs on there. Um, there's a link that I'll put in the description below to this so you can obviously make your own. But what freaking cool projects. I love stuff like this. Just awesome. Obviously, uh, these are probably reset buttons. And this has one button here. And I wonder if that's reset no matter which way you do it. But yeah, 
Very cool. So Mike, thank you very much for saying this stuff in. This cartridge, the, the, this double-ended diagnostic cartridge will be super handy in the future. I really appreciate it and I'll definitely be checking out the other stuff you sent as well. We have a little package here from Stuart in New Hampshire. And yes, this is the same Stuart sent me the Apple II Plus and all those Atari computers, which I haven't even gotten to yet, along with what a really cool MSX computer, an Arabic Commodore 128, like just a whole slew of really awesome machines. I know I'm forgetting other stuff he sent. Uh, there's, there is more, there's other stuff that I've actually opened already. I haven't shown on mail call yet, a number of things, uh, but let's see what's in this little box here. A little small package. Lots of bubble wrap for a little thing in the middle. Okay, what's this? What is this? Oh. <laughs> no way. No way. This is... I can't even believe it. I can't even believe it. Okay, so um, I now have... I can tell already, this is another double-sided diagnostic cartridge. I just, <laughs> I mean, my viewers, my viewers are pretty, pretty amazing. I mentioned something in a video and all of a sudden things show up. So that is pretty funny to have two of these. Um, luckily, I know someone in town here who does a lot of 64 repairs as well. So I'm going to be giving this cartridge to them because uh, I know they don't have one of these. And as I already showed, it's super helpful and useful to have a double sided cartridge. So I will be um, giving this to them. So thank you very much, Stuart, for sending this in. And um, yeah, uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's. That's so funny. Three diagnostic cartridges in one video. That's just amusing. All right, a package from Brett here in Story City, Iowa. Hi to all my Iowa viewers. I hope you're enjoying the summer. Let's see what goodies Brett has sent in. I can see already lots of things. Got an IC here. Oh boy, just a... Uh, whole bunch of stuff. Let's empty out the contents. Oops, I just knocked into the camera. Apologies. Oh, and some Haribo candy. <laughs> All right, well, let's just go right to the Haribo. So these are, yeah, these are US versions. The new watermelon ones. I've actually tried these already and they're really quite good. And I think it's because the, well, it's green. The rind part on here is actually kind of like that milk stuff that they have really commonly in Europe and not in the US, and it's really good. So there's the, there is the candy there with the layers, the layers. Yeah, those are pretty tasty. It's just, uh, you know, kind of a fake watermelon taste, but I like it. And we have ginger lemons. Ooh. So these are also a US sold marketed ones, but they are made in Germany. We'll just give this a quick test here. I like ginger a lot and I like lemons. Let's see. Well, I definitely really enjoy those. If you see these in the store and you like ginger and you like lemon, I really recommend you get this. There's a real zing to the candy. I mean, they're just gummy candies. They're not overly sweet, but it's really got a ginger flavor that just leaves you with a nice zing in your mouth still. I'm still tasting it. I kind of wish that, you know, more ginger ales were that gingery. This one here is like a fruit salad. I've had these before. They're just like the like fruit wedges. They're okay. I mean, you know, they're very sweet. So good for when I have low blood sugar. And this here, sour spaghetti. Well, sour skehetti. Skehetti? <laughs> zing. There's that zing. I was just saying zing. And it wasn't because of the, on the packaging here. Let's pop this open. I do like sour candy quite a bit. Let's just see if this actually has sourness to it. Oh, 
Oh yeah, I approve. That's pretty tasty. It's not too sweet. Again, um, there's a lot of the sour taste because there's not a lot of the gummy. Yummy. So, but I gotta say of all of these, these are my new favorite, probably next to these, then the watermelon, and then these, these fruit wedgie things. You can get these from other brands too, just not really my thing, because they're just, they're so sweet, so, so sweet. So Brett, thanks very much for the candy. I'll move that off to the side. Look at this big pile of stuff here. EA F1 Challenge, 1999 to 02. This is obviously like a Windows game, I guess. There it is, I have my thumb over the product key there. I mean, I have no idea if this activates or anything like that, but just in case. Uh, okay, so let's just, well, you know what? Let's just look at the letter here. Brett says, first of all, I wanna say thank you for your fantastic retro content that you produce. I binge watch your entire channel and find your content fascinating, educational, and always interesting. Many of your videos bring back memories from when I was growing up with my Commodore 64 and Amiga, and then later on when I was working on my PCs for local Best Buy. I've sent along a mix of things you hopefully will find interesting. A naked GoTek, you can fit this into any machine. Yeah, I think uh, he emailed me about this, and here it is. This is the GoTek drive. So this is, this is useful. I think I actually have extra cases because I have 3D printed brackets for these, like in my Amiga 500, I think there's one of these. So I have the, the old case, not to mention I've killed at least one GoTech. So I think I, I kept the cases. Two 8501 R1 CPUs for the Commodore 264 series. That would be like the C16. I believe these are working processors, but I cannot test them myself. Well, Brett, even if they were working, oh, here they are right here. Even if they were working, these just die on the vine. They just die on their own. You don't even touch them and then they're dead. That's just because these chips are like the most unreliable chip inside those machines by far, bar none, all those types of things, super unreliable. A C64 Blinken Diag, a diagnostic cart project. So that's obviously what this is here. A USB wireless dongle might be wireless N. Oh, here it is right here. You know, um, these are quite useful for me and you know why? I use these on Raspberry Pis and obviously the newer Pis have built-in Wi-Fi, but like Pi uh, 2 and the original Pi, they don't. And I definitely have some Pi, older Pis floating around and I just plug these little dongles into them to get them on the internet. So very helpful to have one of these extra. And then two old PC games, hopefully you'll enjoy. Grand Prix 4, I do love car racing. And F1 Challenge, like I had said, here's the CD for that. And a bunch of Harry Bows. Some players I hope you have not encountered yet. Oh yes, I've already broken into those. Keep up the great work and look forward to seeing what you'll surprise us with next. Brett, thanks Brett. So let's just do a quick check of this stuff here. So, I mean, I'm not gonna dig into this too much. Oh, there's a GoTech. Okay, so here's the naked GoTech. He included the OLED screen. That's very handy. Couple screws and a sound kit. Okay, so the sound kit is a little beeper buzzer thing. You plug it into the, over here and it will make little tick noises as the head seek, the virtual heads. And I did buy a handful of these and I have a couple OLED screens floating around but I actually do like to have these. Um, so he didn't include the original LED display, which is fine, because I don't like those anyways. Uh, yep, there it is. There's that little buzzer beeper thingy. So when you connect this up to the GoTech, it, um, it does the ticking. And then this, you like hot glue the little OLED screen. Let's see if I can get the camera to focus. You hot glue this into the front of the case. You can even use the original GoTech case. And that is super handy. I have a box of GoTech parts and I'm gonna put these right into there. The USB dongle is an AirLink 101. I'm pretty sure I have one of these exactly like this on one of my Raspberry Pis. So very, very handy. And let's see these processors here. There they are. I'm gonna to have to break out a machine and we're gonna test these on this video. And then two PC games. This is awesome. I have a Windows 98 machine, which would be appropriate, I think, at least for this one. What about this game? Does it say what OS it needs? Doesn't really, but I assume it's similar vintage. So that machine has a Voodoo 3 in it, like Pentium 3, one gigahertz, Windows 98. It's kind of perfect for games like this. It's, um, 
is it working? I think it works right now. I haven't used it in a while, but uh, definitely we'll need to uh, give these a try at a future time on that machine. So this here, the Blinken Diag cartridge project, not familiar with this whatsoever. So there's the cartridge. It goes into the cartridge slot. Obviously this screws in on top of it. Problem, oops, goes like this. So all the LEDs are held in place. Oh, this, uh, I assume this is from, no, I was about to say this here looks like it was from the GoTech, but I guess this actually goes on here. So that's something for the 64. He has included all of the parts to put this thing together. I see all the IC, the sockets, headers, everything. Okay, well, you know what? I think what I'm gonna do is this will be something to assemble on the second channel. What's in here? Probably some ICs. Okay, there's the programmed EEPROM, EEPROM. Probably goes right there. I don't know anything about this project. So this would be fun to do on the second channel. There doesn't appear to be any instructions here, but I'm sure if I just do a quick Google, I'll find those. So I'll figure out how to put this together. All right. Let me put this stuff out of the way and go grab Commodore 16 so we can test out the CPUs. Okay, so the, here's this Commodore 16. I've had it sitting over on the side for a while and I don't remember what I did to this thing. Screws are not in it, so it's already ready to go. Okay, I remember now. This has the CPU from a Commodore 64 in it. And one of my viewers sent me an adapter PCB so I could take out that horrible stack of sockets with a bunch of wires that I did to make the CPU work. So this is the real deal CPU for this machine. So let's uh, pop this out of here and we'll give it a test. Oh, actually, you know what? Before we do that, I gotta do what I always say I need to do, right? And is plug it in, make sure the computer actually works first because you don't wanna be chasing down issues like I think the CPU is dead, when the reality is the computer is broken in some other way. Okay, so it's plugged in. Here we go, turn that on. Where is the video? There it is, a working machine. It actually works. <laughs> you know, you never know with these machines because it's got the, the TED chip. It's the one under all these heat sinks here. This thing dies as well. So we'll pop this off. We'll turn it off and I'll pop this little adapter board out. Uh, let's see here. Oh yeah, look. This has got a replacement PLA in here, which is Daniel's project. Daniel Mantioni, who did the uh, GAL PLA for the 64. I think I did a video about this, right? Did I? I hope I did. If not, there'll be a video coming up about that. So here we go. Let's see, will these CPUs actually work? First, check out the pins. They look good. Socket goes... The notch goes to the left. All right, what's gonna happen? Place your bets. Turn this on and this thing works. I can't believe it. This is my first working CPU. Unbelievable, check mark. Now, I don't know if these things get hot while they're running. It's pretty warm already. They run at two megahertz on this machine. This machine's faster than a Commodore 64. So that is intriguing. Now I'm gonna to have to replace the kernel. So I have the original kernel in here and the kernel has been modified to specifically work with the 6510. Now the computer boots obviously, but the IO is not gonna work correctly with this kernel in here. So I've never actually had a real CPU to test with. And henceforth, there are games that use fast loaders that don't work with my kernel mod here with the 64 CPU. So I've never been able to test those games with the real deal. I'll actually be able to. Can't believe the CPU works. Yeah, it gets, gets kind of warm. So I'll be, I'll be putting a heat sink on there. Let's get this chip out of here. I don't know why I'm not using my chip extractor because this thing so much easier. There we go, pop that right out. We'll just put that right there on the RF modulator. Next up, another one of these chips, same part number. Its legs are all perfectly straight. It's in very nice shape notch to the left, push that down. Here we go. It works as well. It freaking works as well. I am blown away, 
blown away. That's amazing. Two working chips. The cool thing about that is I have this machine, which needs a working chip, and I have a plus four that's got a bad chip as well. Now, Stuart also sent me some of these machines. Some of them work, some needed a CPU. I know at least a couple of those are, are, are actually working with the original CPU. The, so I don't know, I, but I think there might be an extra CPU that he sent me as well to refix the machines that he sent. That's quite possible. I have, it's in a box with all those machines for further testing. Anyhow, that is amazing. Brett, thank you very much for all this cool stuff. I'll be having to put together that kit on the second channel and then the other stuff uh, you may see in the future at some point, especially like the game. Maybe I'll do a quick review. I'll be like a, a Clint LGR style game review. Um, maybe not. <laughs> I'm not very good at those things. Anyhow, that is very exciting. I, I still can't, cannot believe it. I know it seems silly to be shocked about a working chip, but I'm shocked. I am shocked. We have an international package. This one comes from Anders in Denmark. Hi to all my Danish viewers. A country I have not been to yet, unfortunately. I would absolutely love to go on a trip to Denmark. That would be amazing. I have to, of course, add, I would love to go to Sweden and Norway and Finland as well. Other countries I have not been to either. So let's see what goodies lie within. I'm wondering if there's gonna be some delicious Danish candy in here. Oh, look, we have some Harry Bows from Denmark. Oh, that's quite the assortment there. And these ones here, oh boy, super piratos with a pirate, salty and hard. <laughs> now these cells say share size. I love how it's in English. And that's it. We just have a little note here. Hello, Adrian. A little thanks all the way from Denmark. I have decided to include three bags of Haribo since you are such a big fan of the brand and I have chosen three bags that are produced in our little country. As Haribo exclusively produces for each location's taste worldwide, then the content of these bags might be a tiny bit different than what you normally will find on the German market. Of course, some of the content tastes and have the exact same texture as the German Haribo as you have tried and tested on your channel. And I have a lot more to test. Um, I know I, I said I would do candy stuff on the second channel, but I have such a backlog of candy there that I will be getting to that. Don't worry, everyone, don't worry. There'll be, there'll be candy. But um, yeah, there's a lot, a lot to get through there. So anyways, load Harry Bo, come A, come a one, run. <laughs> we have the uh, star mix, which is this one here. So that must be Danish here, right? Yeah, as if I can pronounce, I cannot, I cannot pronounce Danish at all. Just the average mix of different stuff that you know. There's stuff in here that doesn't quite look familiar, but it's probably very typical. There's like a fried egg in there, it looks like. The Matador mix, um, that is this one here, this orange bag. This is a mix of different black licorice and wine gums. Personally, I love the soft coins, um, though they need to be eaten a little like they were hard candy or else they'll stick to your teeth. Also, the eggs that are in black licorice covered with a white sugar coating. If you take note of the taste, each colored egg has a slightly different taste compared to the other colors. White is coconut, and then either the pink or the red are mint, the others being a bizarre mix of strawberry raspberry. <laughs> oh, that is so hilarious. The matter mix is well known here in Denmark, as we have had it for the last 35 years, or perhaps more. I have no real clue as to how long the mix have been on the market here. And then the super piratos. <laughs> <laughs> These ones here. I know this will be funny to see your reaction when you taste it. I, I can eat a lot of it. However, this is because I'm used to it. However, it is it has rarely been tested on these Americans try candy channels on YouTube. <laughs> because of that, I believe this kind is unknown to America. Let me just say this. It is quite strong. <laughs> just be careful not to eat too much. Thank you for all the content you produce, Anders. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, that is too funny. I'm gonna have to reposition the camera and we're gonna do a little candy taste test here. 
All right, so now everyone can see me here. So let's break out the uh, Pirados here, the very strong licorice Danish flavor ones. I am not even a fan of licorice. Oh, they're okay, they're like, they're like coins. So you could place your eyes there. <laughs> I'm not even a licorice fan. So um, yeah, strong licorice, weak licorice. No, no, the, the black color, the anise flavoring is, is not my thing, but here we go. Oh. Okay, I took that one out of my mouth. Um, I have to say, it's very strong. <laughs> it's very strong. I don't know if it's the strongest I've ever tasted. I've, I've had stuff from the Netherlands that people have sent in, very strong as well. <laughs> but, wow. I mean, there isn't really any sweetness at all to these candies. They are very, very salty. They're very, very chewy. Um, they don't break down at all. Like you would have to kind of suck on one for quite a long time. This is a very generous sized bag. <laughs> you could, this could last a very long time unless you're a big fan of the licorice flavor. So <laughs> that is so hilarious. So yeah, um, I'm gonna try some of these here which I am sure are gonna be a little bit more palatable to my taste buds. Although there is also black licorice in the star mix here. So, uh, or this isn't star mix, sorry, the Matador. So obviously the Danes, they love their licorice. Let's just see if this is the same strength as that stuff. No, it's not. That is way, way less strong. So that licorice in there is not bad. I mean, it's it's licorice, but it's got some sweetness to it. It's not incredibly salty and sour. <laughs> so not bad. Okay, so here are the eggs he was talking about. They're actually not like a fried egg. It's the shape of a little egg, like a almost like it's a hard candy or something. So just to refresh my memory, the egg is actually black licorice coated in a sugar flavoring. You can definitely taste the black licorice. It's very chewy. It's unusual um, because it's black licorice. I'm not raving about it, <laughs> but that is personal preference to not like black licorice. I think if you like black licorice, those are probably very tasty and interesting. Here's a little weird stripey thing. That's kind of an interesting taste as well. Maybe it's black licorice-ish black licorice-ish, I don't know. This whole bag, everything I've eaten so far doesn't taste like anything I've ever had before. I mean, obviously I've had black licorice, but I've never had a bag of Haribo with anything that tastes like this. So I really like this, Anders, to, that you sent this to me. This is super cool. I'm gonna try one of these round jello gummy discs here, because this probably has a somewhat normal taste. Normal as in typical Haribo. Yeah, that was a delicious taste. It was just sort of a fruity, delicious, sort of lemony flavor to it. And not fake lemon either. It tasted pretty, pretty yummy. This has got some of these Pirados, Pirados in here. I see a few of these in here. So I'm going to skip that one. Let's just see if anything else in here is interesting. So some different black licorice and different shape. There's some different colored fruit gummy shapes. Yeah, so like this is a strawberry or something. Yeah, that was really good. That one was yummy. It was very fruity flavor. So what an interesting mix. It's like really sour and, and salty licorice mixed with fruity flavors and you get a whole assortment in here. Um, and lastly, just very quickly, I will taste the star mix, which probably is, you know, pretty much um, what we're used to here. Got a little frog here with the white stuff on the back. Yeah, that's pretty much exactly what I expected. So Anders, thank you very much for sending in that Danish Haribos. Now I am even more intrigued by Denmark and I, I gotta go, I gotta go. And with that, I'm gonna end this mail call video here. I hope this new format wasn't too unusual, but don't worry, this is not gonna be the new normal. I do like how much faster the production is overall for 
this format where I'm not doing the separate sections where I'm opening it there and doing the on the bench here. But don't worry, I will go back next week to doing it the old fashioned way just because there's a big backlog of stuff that I've already opened. So once again, thanks to all the viewers and patrons who sent stuff in for this video. And of course, thank you to all the viewers and patrons who sent stuff in for, well, previous videos and future videos, the things I haven't shown yet. So huge thank you to everyone. And also, of course, big thanks to my patrons to, who are supporting the channel. I really, really appreciate it. it. makes life a lot easier. I just spent a bunch of money that I got from that on upgrading my disk storage and my on-site NAS video production stuff. I'm kind of annoyed because hard drive prices are through the roof. So luckily I, I have enough space at this time, but I'm upgrading the infrastructure that runs it all just to help streamline the whole process. So Patreon made all that possible. So if you like this video, thumbs up. If you didn't, you know, all that stuff you could do, thumbs down, hit that subscribe button. Don't forget to check out the second channel where I'll probably be putting some videos related to some of these things over there. And um, there are a lot more candy things to show on the second channel. There's so, so much candy over there. It's an unimaginable amount. So I appreciate everyone sending stuff in, but I gotta say, <laughs> uh, too much is probably a, not such a good thing just because I can't consume all of it myself. So <laughs> anyhow, all right, that is going to be it. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.